Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us this afternoon for the first in a three-part online briefing mini-series about coastal resilience and natural disaster recovery in Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. I'm Dan Bursett, the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. Before we start, though, let me take a moment to step back and offer a thought or two about the broader issues of environmental equity and justice. Just as it was difficult to talk about climate change against the backdrop of the awful spread of the coronavirus outbreak, it is hard to stay focused on these issues when inequality and injustice is taking lives and infringing on our right to assemble and protest peacefully. In fact, though, whether it's coronavirus or the events over the past several days, while our awareness is heightened, inequality and injustice are systemic and ever-present threats to the well-being of our communities. The challenges and risks of climate change are great. I hope we emerge from the outbreak better prepared and informed to make science-based decisions. And above everything else, I hope we finally have the strength to address inequality and injustice so we can take the steps we need to mitigate, adapt, and become more resilient to climate change together. In order to complete a transition to a decarbonized clean energy economy, we will need to find ways for everyone to contribute and ensure we leave nobody or their communities behind. If you're joining us today for the first time, this week's online briefing mini-series is the conclusion of an extensive year-long effort to tell the stories of regional approaches to coastal resilience. In 2019, we brought together panels of experts, practitioners, and community leaders from the Gulf Coast, Northeast, New England, Louisiana, and the West Coast. Earlier this year, we convened experts who discussed efforts around the Great Lakes in the Southeast states, Hawaii, and Alaska, as well as the need for better climate adaptation data. Today's online briefing is part one of the mini-series, Federal Support and Local Action. Tomorrow, we will cover resilient housing and communities, and on Friday, we will learn about sustainable democratic energy and public health. And for the entire time, the region of focus will be Puerto Rico and, of course, the U.S. Virgin Islands. If you've missed any of our briefings on coastal resilience or on any other, pretty much, climate or clean energy policy topic, you can access briefing summaries and video recordings at www.eesi.org. And when you visit us online, please take a, mo a moment to sign up for our Climate Change Solutions newsletter to learn about other resilience initiatives, clean energy legislation, and to stay informed about all manner of ESI goings on, including our briefing schedule. Our online briefing today, like I said, will cover coastal resilience in Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Every region covered so far is different in terms of the challenges and the innovation of those who live there. And the communities of our Caribbean neighbors have a special story to tell. Part of that story is rooted in the heritage and the history of its people. And part is due to the fact that they have done their best to build and live more resiliently in the wake of back-to-back -back Category 5 hurricanes, Irma and Maria, that hit the islands in 2017, followed by Hurricane Barrel in 2018 and Hurricane Dorian last year, as well as several other tropical storms. That story, how can you improve the resilience of communities while also recovering from unrelenting natural disasters must be told. And unfortunately, as storms are increasingly severe and frequent, the experience of Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands will be increasingly relevant more to more and more coastal communities on the mainland. One last thing before we turn to our panelists. Because we're not in the same room today, I cannot call on you if you have a question. But we'd love to hear your question. So please follow EESI on Twitter, at EESI online, and send in your questions that way. Or, if you'd like, you can send an email to EESI at EESI.org. We will draw from your question submissions after we hear from our panelists. And now, let's get to our panelists. We will hear first from Margarita Varela Rosa, who serves as counsel to the U.S. House Committee on Natural Resources. In that role, Margarita helps advance legislation that pertains to the U.S. territories of Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, as well as the Northern Mariana Islands, excuse me, Guam, and American Samoa. She has worked for the Department, Departments of Homeland Security and Defense, as an engineer, Margarita has been honored by the Maryland Society of Professional Engineers and the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers for her contributions to the engineering field as well as her leadership. It is a special treat to hear directly from a policy expert on Capitol Hill, and I am eager to hear about the status and prospects for legislation and appropriations this year. Margarita, thank you for joining us today. I look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much for, for the invitation. 
uh, on behalf of the Natural Resources Committee, this is um, an important discussion for us uh, since it, it has been so difficult to ensure that um, resources that were appropriated by Congress as a result of um, natural disasters um, are just dispersed for Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, in addition, the yesterday was the first day of this year's um, hurricane season, which NOAA predicts that it will be above normal. Um, so we're eager to share with you information on what are our priorities uh, to ensure that Puerto Rico and, and the Virgin Islands are prepared. Um, the chair of the Natural Resources Committee, uh, Congressman Raul Grijalva, has visited the Caribbean after Hurricanes Irma and Maria with his team to assess the situation in the territories and um, have a firsthand experience of uh, what the impact and the um, damage was in, in the year 2017. Some of that impact um, is still visible today. Um, for example, the Puerto Rico energy grid is still very vulnerable. Um, and my plan today is to go over these natural disasters uh, with you um, to let you know what is the, the current situation and what are our policy priorities. As most of you remember, uh, the year 2017 was um, significant for, for the Caribbean. Um, Hurricane Irma um, devastated the U.S. Virgin Islands. It was a Category 5 hurricane. Uh, with winds up to 178 miles per hour. Um, it caused significant, significant structural damage, um, including to police stations, airports, hosp the airport hospitals, and also to, to the ferry. Um, there, were, there was also um, death involved. There were four fatalities and damages up to $1.1 billion. Um, Two weeks after Hurricane Irma impacted the U.S. Virgin Islands and also part of the, the northeast of Puerto Rico, um, Hurricane Irma affected uh, Puerto Rico and also um, somewhat, uh, also the U.S. Virgin Islands, uh, specifically the island of San Croix. Um, Hurricane Maria caused almost um, $90 billion of damages in Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, but not only that, and most importantly, it also cost the lives of approximately 3,000 individuals in the island of Puerto Rico. Um, the damage um, that was experienced um, included the, the, almost the destruction of the island's uh, electric grid. Uh, for months, the population was without power. Um, schools were impacted, hospitals, um, the local airport. Um, and in the U.S. Virgin Islands, Congresswoman Stacy Plaskett um, assessed that approximately 90% of the buildings of the island were, were affected. So it was a major event um, for both um, U.S. territories that required significant, a, a um, significant federal response. Um, two supplemental packages were approved to um, address the destruction. Um, Congress passed legislation to provide emergency funding um, that included community development block grants for disaster. Um, and that was meant to help with the transformation of the electric grid um, of Puerto Rico and to rebuild homes and schools in the U.S. Virgin Islands uh, in Puerto Rico and also to create resiliency so that future natural disasters would not cause the same impact and devastation that um, they experienced. Um, so those funds were approved by Congress. Um, they were signed into law by the president. However, um, it has been extremely difficult to ensure that those funds are actually dispersed to Puerto Rico and also the U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, Congress has had to conduct a lot of oversight over the federal agencies that have um, that responsibility in, in this particular case, HUD, um, so that notices and also um, grant agreements are published and also approved so the money can be used by the local governments. 
after these um, hurricanes affected uh, Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands, um, we have also had to to assist the local territories with other natural disasters that have impacted um, the region. Um, most importantly, there have been approximately a thousand earthquakes that have impacted the southern region of Puerto Rico since late 2019. And that includes 13 earthquakes that are greater than uh, five magnitude um, and have resulted in also devastation to schools, to homes, uh, roads, and the econo economic development of, of that area. Um, thousands of people were impacted, um, primarily their mental health, since this was since, since this these were events that continued to affect them for um, several months and actually continue to affect them to this day. Um, unfortunately, these earthquakes have also um, affected the electric grid of the island. Um, so currently, the state of the Puerto Rico Electric Power Authority is not um, is not the it's unreliable, let's put it that way. Um, the grid is still unreliable um, and, and requires a lot of investment to ensure that the people of Puerto Rico um, stop experiencing frequent outages. As a result of these earthquakes, the House passed HR 5687 to appropriate additional disaster funding um, to Puerto Rico since this was a major um, disaster. Um, it was declared as such by the president. Um, however, that bill that passed the House um, hasn't been considered in the Senate. Um, so we continue in the House to advocate for, for this legislation to be included in future um, legislation to ensure that the buildings and the infrastructure that needs to be rebuilt um, to be resilient in the area um, can 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 actually be um, addressed. So these are two major, these are three major disasters that have affected the, the islands of Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. However, there are other threats that continue to affect the, the resiliency of um, their infrastructure. Um, for, ex for example, coastal, coastal erosion, which I'm sure our next speaker will provide more information on. Um, we, We'll, we will continue to advocate for resources to be dispersed, those resources that were already approved, um, and also to ensure that additional resources are assigned to address these, these natural disasters. Um, and those are the, the priorities um, you can help us with um, to make sure that the, the residents of the territories have the assistance um, that, um, that they deserve. Thank you, Margarita. Uh, that was a really great presentation, and, and, and uh, I'm very pleased that you could join us today. Um, uh, thank you very much, and you'll be with us for uh, the remainder of the hour, which is uh, very generous. You have a lot to do, and so it means a lot for you to be with us. Um, for anyone who might have joined us a little late, let me just make a uh, quick reminder or say a quick reminder about questions. Uh, we'll be taking questions, but we'll be doing that at the end. Um, so after our second panelist, who I'll introduce in just a moment, um, if you um, uh, would like a question asked, uh, please follow us on Twitter and ask us, and that would be at ESI online. Um, if you would like to send an email, you can do that with your question, uh, EESI at EESI.org, and we'll like I said, get to those when we um, are a little bit later in the presentation. And just as a reminder, in case you did miss anything, of course, this is being uh, webcast. All of the information that you'll hear today, including written summaries of both presentations, will be available uh, online within a couple days at most. Um, our team does a really great job with getting those online. So if you missed anything, never fear, we've got you covered. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our second panelist, Ernesto Diaz. Ernesto currently serves as Director of the Office for Coastal Management and Climate Change and Coordinator of the Puerto Rico Climate Change Council. He led the publication of the first State of the Puerto Rico Climate Report in 2014, The Road to Resilience, A Guide to Adaptation Strategies, also in 2014, and the first standalone chapter for the U.S. Caribbean 
as part of the fourth National Climate Assessment in 2018. After Hurricanes Irma and Maria, he served as state on-site coordinator for various response and recovery efforts under the Emergency Support Function 10, Sunken Vessel Removal, and Coastal and Nearshore Debris Removal, and requested the first mission assignment to assess damages to coral reefs, wetlands, beaches, and dunes under the Natural and Cultural Resources sector. Ernesto, it is great to have you with us today. I look forward to your presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And thanks to the Environmental and Energy Study Institute for inviting us to share part of our work uh, with the colleagues and provide this briefing on our work. So this afternoon, I'll be speaking about the Puerto Rico Climate Change Council and the work we conducted under the US Global Change Research Program when we, through six key messages, uh, prepared the US Caribbean chapter under the fourth National Climate Assessment Report. I'll be speaking also about effects and impacts on socioecological vulnerabilities uh, of climate uh, impacts in, in Puerto Rico and the Caribbean. Uh, I'll be also briefing, briefly referring to the recently adopted policy on mitigation, adaptation, and resilience, Law 33 of 2019. Uh, and as uh, it was uh, discussed by our previous uh, guest, uh, I'll be referring a bit also to the hurricanes Irma and Maria, particularly from the response and damage assessments uh, side, and uh, what we're trying to do in order to secure and uh, effectively implement projects using public assistance, uh, uh, sections 428 and 406 of the Stafford Act, as well as uh, projects that we have developed uh, in, for the Hazard Mitigation Grants Program under Section 404. I'll be also presenting uh, something that we've been working intensively, intensively on, which is the uh, use of nature-based uh, features and try to make them cost-effective uh, so that we have the ecosystem services uh, of these uh, re systems uh, employed for infrastructure protection and communities protection purposes, but also uh, benefiting from the ecological side that they uh, are intended to. So next. Okay. So I'll talk about the Puerto Rico Climate Change Council. We're a voluntary association of over 150 members and collaborators that voluntarily uh, gather to assess the state of Puerto Rico's climate using best science and knowledge available to understand Puerto Rico's social ecological vulnerabilities and to develop adaptation strategies to build a resilient society. Representatives from, oops, is from, from federal agencies, commonwealth agencies, not-for-profit organizations, public and private universities, as well as colleagues from the Caribbean and the United States and Europe, uh, collaborate to jointly uh, gather the best uh, geophysical and chemical scientific knowledge and assess effects and impacts of those trends and changes on ecology and biodiversity, as well as in society and economy. Obviously, an important component of this is how do we use that data and that information? And communicating climate change and coastal hazards is one of our key missions. As it was mentioned during the introduction, we prepared and, and published the first ever Puerto Rico State of the Climate Report. We, it was published in 2014. We also developed a document uh, called Ruta Hacia la Resiliencia, or Road to Resilience, which is a guide of adaptation strategies uh, for the island-wide level, municipal level, the home level, and the individual level. However, after severe droughts in 2014 and 2015, 
uh, hurricanes in 2017, earthquakes, COVID-19. We obviously have demonstrated that we have a certain degree of resiliency. However, we needed to update this document and we're working on it, conducting a SWOT analysis and, and trying to uh, integrate it on a, under a multi-hazard approach. In 2018, we also published the uh, uh, chapter 20 of the US Caribbean uh, uh, under the fourth uh, national climate assessment. And uh, I, I'll be referring to uh, this uh, results uh, throughout the presentation. So the key messages were fresh water, marine resources, coastal systems, rising temperatures, disaster response, and adapt adaptive capacity, in which we also collaborated with colleagues from the wider Caribbean area. So to conduct our work here in Puerto Rico, we had to take it also in, in the account the, the context. 40% of the population worldwide live in the coastal areas. 54% of the population live in cities where 70% of the energy is consumed and 75% of the greenhouse gases are, are emitted. The, ten, the trend is that uh, by 2050, 68% of the people will be living in cities. So what was the reality in Puerto Rico? It's even more dramatic. 61% of the population living the, in the coastal areas at 44 coastal municipalities. Uh, we have a coastline of uh, 799 miles, 1,225 beaches, and as it was mentioned earlier, 60% of those beaches exhibit certain degrees of uh, erosion. And uh, obviously for an island that relies on tourism, that's of great concern, but also beaches absorb energy and the reduction on the width of the beach uh, creates an increased exposure to storm risks. So we're not only studying those, but identifying adaptive uh, strategies as well as alternatives to address these issues. We have two, two ongoing studies with the Army Corps of Engineers, two feasibility studies that in the future will be probably presented to Congress for allocation of funding in terms of um, the construction phase of that study. So in, in our coastal areas, those 44 coastal municipalities, all of our airports and ports, of course, are located in these areas, as, as well as you know thousands of miles of primary roads, bridges, culverts, and piers. Also, all of our current uh, energy facilities, uh, uh, which are fossil fuel powered uh, are on coastal areas. Also our communications, all the fiber optic cables land and exit at coastal areas. So uh, dealing with uh, resiliency and adaptation and uh, addressing these issues in, in the coastal areas is of great concern and importance. So this is the reality that I have presented in terms of numbers and, and stats. A, a lot of uh, you know, a densely urbanized area in the metro area with the main airport, the International Luis Muñoz Marine Airport, as well as the ports and energy facilities developed a very low elevation above mean sea level. Obviously, uh, uh, sea level rises of great concern. During 2017, uh, we had uh, the most active uh, uh, hurricane season on, on record, and you can see Hurricane Irma impacting Florida as uh, it had exited already the Virgin Islands and had affected northern northeast Puerto Rico. Uh, hurricane Jose didn't make landfall, and then Hurricane Maria uh, on its way to Puerto Rico. After we were impacted, so we, you know, power went out. Uh, I was without power only for 34 days, but 
some people were without power for 10, 11 months. Uh, so the, the power grid is uh, something and the transformation of the energy uh, provision to, to home dwellers, commerces, etc., are obviously of great concern. And I know that's going to be the subject of discussions tomorrow and Friday. Second day after Hurricane Maria, uh, my team and I went out and started documenting damages. And this is what we saw. Uh, a lot of areas impacted by direct wave attack. attack. Uh, uh, the floods affected not only uh, private and public properties, but also uh, wetlands uh, that were underwater for uh, days, weeks, and mangroves drowned. So it, a lot of uh, biodiversity was lost. Uh, one of the cases that I worked with immediately after the hurricane was the response uh, to sunken vessels that not only were a loss to the owners of the vessel, but were a, a hazard because those uh, boats or vessels would be uh, probably impacting coral reefs and other structures as well as other boats that might have, might not, may have not uh, suffered effects and impacts uh, from, from the storm surge and the winds and the, and the waves. But it is important to emphasize that the U.S. Coast Guard came with a plan they were really well prepared to respond. They set up their shop. I, I worked as a state on site coordinator and, and there, there was no time wasted there. So I, my hat off to, and, and kudos to the Coast Guard because that's something that should be used by other federal agencies in order to prepare the, their response procedures. That's uh, my humble opinion. I worked also with other federal agencies during the response phase and currently during the recovery phase. And definitely there is much room for improvement. I know that also during 2017, uh, federal agencies, particularly FEMA, had to work uh, with other disasters, you know, not only Maria, but also Harvey in Houston. And then they had to deal with the forest fires in California. But Please take a look at the SOPs that the U.S. Coast Guard implements in order to uh, respond to these events because it, that, that could help a lot, not only the, to the federal agents, agencies to avoid suboptimal use of funds and optimize their interventions, but also for the people in need in those areas that have been affected by disasters. I will also talk about this. This is a groundbreaking study. This is the first time ever that FEMA funded um, a damage assessment and triage work for uh, natural resources that serve as critical infrastructure. We requested a mission to be assigned to NOAA. It was approved. NOAA conducted this fantastic work with uh, the support from colleagues from the University of Puerto Rico, students and volunteers, obviously all experimented divers and marine scientists. And this uh, damage assessment has proven to be very useful into subsequent, subsequent requests that we have presented to FEMA for recover, recovery purposes. And why coral reefs are important? The pictures that I showed earlier were those areas that were impacted by direct wave attack because they didn't have coral reef or reefs uh, protection. However, the San Juan metro area, which is where most infrastructure and economic activity occurs, didn't suffer from direct wave attack, but uh, even though we got the floods, but the wave attack, the waves were attenuated at the crest of those coral reefs that even though they resulted uh, with mechanical damage from 30 feet high waves and, and more, but they were attenuated up to 97%. So we are requesting 
from FEMA to invest on the repair of this critical infrastructure that happens to be natural, but more effective than any gray or man-made in infrastructure. And, and what we're asking is also that we need to consider that hurricanes of higher intensity, Cat 4 and Cat 5, are becoming more frequent, you know, mostly due to uh, increased uh, sea surface temperatures and uh, the coincidence of uh, rains in northern Africa and the absence of El Nino, for example. So the projections for this year, as it was mentioned earlier, are that close to 19 named storms will impact the, the Atlantic and Caribbean, and six of them might be of higher intensity, cuts three, four, or five. So the investment on coral reefs, uh, nourishment of beaches, dunes, and wetlands as a means of ameliorating coastal hazards is something that uh, would be a smart investment to uh, reduce the cost of future disasters because this is the trend and this is what we're going to be facing uh, more often in the future. How do we know that? These are the trends and the projections. Uh, this is, uh, these are published in our National Climate Assessment chapter, chapter 20. So the projections is that atmospheric surface atmospheric temperature will be increasing by two to nine degrees Fahrenheit. So the best scenario is that we increase by two degrees. In terms of precipitation, we'll have 10 to 40 percent reduction in precipitation in the Puerto Rico area. And in terms of CO2 concentration, I checked the Mauna Loa station a couple of days ago, and we're up to 416 parts per million, and that's uh, obviously triggering ocean acidification and uh, increased sea surface temperatures, which not only fuels hurricanes, but also contributes to bleach corals. So see the integrated approach that we're taking to this. You know, we're interested in protecting biodiversity, but also life and property. Sea level rise is kind of our main concern because this exacerbates what happens uh, regularly with tides, waves, and the intense hurricanes come associated with storm surges and storm surges riding on top of a higher sea level have the potential to affect and impact the uh, further inland. So all these the structures that may uh, be outside of a flood zone currently, according to FEMA or planning board's maps, uh, will be probably affected by floods in the near future and will be exposed to wave attack and storm surges uh, most certainly. So our intermediate uh, scenarios are between three to four uh, feet increases by 2100 and between 9 to 11 feet uh, in a uh, sea level rise increase by uh, 2100 as an extreme scenario. Other scenarios by other colleagues are more dramatic and, and present a higher uh, scenarios of sea level rise. This is uh, some graphics of still water, it doesn't include tides or wave action, nor storm surge, even though we have modeled those. A one foot sea level rise increase on the lower left corner would you know, temporarily affect the international airport as a landmark that we can use as a reference. A three feet high sea level rise would be permanently affecting some areas of the airport and a 10 feet increase will definitely be affecting uh, international uh, communications uh, for, in Puerto Rico. 
So I mentioned that in 2019, a statute was a, a, a approved, adopted by the legislature and signed into law by the governor. Uh, it's called the Climate Change Mitigation Adaptation and Resilience uh, Law and establishes a public policy uh, regarding the Puerto Rico power grid to progressively use less fossil fuels. Uh, it, it presents a coal uh, phase out, promotes a uh, clean energy. It, it also uh, promotes to improve energy efficiency to lower greenhouse gas emissions from other land uses and activities uh, such as agriculture, promotes the use of electric cars. In fact, it calls for the whole fleet of the government to be uh, powered by electric or hybrid uh, cars beginning this year. Uh, and then it, it promotes reforestation and ecosystem services uh, in, uh, improvement. It creates also an expert advisory committee that uh, meets about twice uh, per month. Uh, it, it calls for that uh, committee to create a mitigation, adaptation and resilience plan I know that the committee will be requesting an extension to deliver the, the plan, uh, which is sectoral in nature and has a multiple uh, requirements to be implemented by different uh, agencies and sectors, including the, the private sector, commerce, etc. It, it doesn't assign funding, but provides opportunities for the committee and, and, and the initiatives to uh, tap into different funding mechanisms. That's a, a, a weak point of the statute. Uh, it also creates a joint Puerto Rico Senate and House of Reps uh, Commission. And as in the in law 17 that was also adopted in 2019, it calls for establishes some renewal, renewable energy goals which is 100% clean energy production by 2050 and 20% by 2022, 40% by 2025 and 60% by 2040. I must confess that I'm not an expert on mitigation issues nor on electric power mitigation. I focus mostly on adaptation and resiliency building efforts. And this is uh, what we have been working on more recently, looking at what's being done worldwide by the World Bank and Swiss Re, which is a reinsurance company that has created a very innovative products and is very interesting because they are obviously concerned about most disasters that they have reinsured will be ending uh, on their desktops and they'll have to be addressing claims uh, by those insurance companies that insured those properties have been totaled or damaged by a more frequent disasters occurring worldwide. So it's important to take a look at what they are doing worldwide and this is what we are asking FEMA to, to do. I, I know that they have uh, created a couple of uh, programs that proactively uh, bring uh, these new opportunities to fund innovative projects to build resiliency and reduce the cost of future disasters, but we can do more and we can do it better. So I, I would urge to take a look at the AirDeck Army Corps of Engineers Engineering with Nature Approaches. Also in terms of corals, uh, uh, the National Academy of Sciences uh, put together an, an excellent uh, product. Uh, obviously this is for those jurisdictions, uh, seven of those of, of ours, I would say that uh, in, in, in the United States have corals, but also in the wider, wider Caribbean, is of great interest is to build resiliency through innovative interventions with these uh, uh, systems that are threatened by climate change, but that also uh, bring resilience and attenuate wave energy and absorb energy from, from storm surges. So I think that it, there is a great opportunity to embed some of these initiatives into coastal engineering approaches and uh, you know we we need to continue uh, fine-tuning our land use plans and zoning regulations 
uh, by creating or integrating dynamic setbacks and coastal construction lines. Uh, several states already have that, North Carolina and Hawaii, for example. Uh, we need to increase the freeboard requirements and promote adaptive design so that as sea level rises, structures can be retrofitable. I know that FEMA's community rating system uh, provides incentives for this to be done, but we need to be more aggressive in terms of uh, fostering this type of interventions. We believe that there is a great opportunity through this recovery phase to create a new generation of Puerto Rico infrastructure. Particularly in the coastal areas, it should be hybrid and nature-based uh, and should it involve structural, traditional uh, protection and adaptation measures, as well as to um, integrate nature-based solutions, uh, thinking of uh, coral reefs, wetlands, beach and dunes, uh, restoration and, and creation, uh, green swells, as well as horizontal levees, for example. Typically, we hit a wall when we propose this type of interventions because of the traditional benefit cost analysis tools of the Army Corps of Engineers, FEMA, and HUD uh, are built to favor rapid return on investment, while jurisdictions, particularly those affected by disasters, uh, inherit infrastructure that may require a higher operations and maintenance. And in the case of Puerto Rico, for example, we are under a tremendous fiscal constraint due to the economic uh, crisis that we're uh, experiencing. And, and we even have a fiscal oversight board. So we need as a sponsor and the owner of the infrastructure to reduce our costs in the future, while the, the agency that's funding the, the project is interested in uh, the biggest bang for the buck, which is obviously the low, the, the rapid return on investment. We need to uh, discuss those issues. I think that's something that, that's very important for Congress to take a look at and for federal like, agencies also to uh, continue this di dialogue. In our case, we are sure that the infrastructure that we propose has a longer design life and definitely is aesthetically more attractive and can bring up a tourism and recreation opportunities. Uh, as such, we requested under Section 428 of, of the Stafford Act uh, an investment of $31 million uh, to uh, restore those coral reefs that attenuated 97% of the wave energy that otherwise would have impacted and increased the cost of marias on the metropolitan area. Uh, but the question still remains, and this has not been decided, uh, even though we started working on this project uh, at around December 2017, is the restoration of a coral reef by the Puerto Rico DNR eligible for public assistance? We still don't have an answer to that. However, we have worked, and there, I have many folders on the upper <laughs> right-hand cor corner, where we have uh, prepared 44 hazard uh, mitigation grants uh, program uh, follow for projects, uh, totaling close to $100 million. Um, and still, uh, we're in the phase of uh, determining eligibility or desirability. And I know that there are uh, discussions at a higher level, I would say, where FEMA and CORE 3, which is the Office of the Government uh, dealing with these issues, uh, where uh, priorities are uh, electric power and aqua sensors, sewers. But uh, the re reminding uh, the, my, my previous statements, let's take a look at what the Coast Guard does in terms of SOPs and try to bring it to other uh, sectors and, and, and missions and, and discussions so that we can be more effective in getting this uh, funding allocated. These are, and I, it was mentioned by 
the my the previous speaker uh, you know there is a lot of funding available i think we we could use that to build resilient uh, infrastructure uh, innovative infrastructure uh, i'm guessing around 85 plus billion dollars might be uh, available through if public assistance, hazard mitigation, uh, supplemental funding, as well as CDBGDR funding. But uh, here in Puerto Rico, we're not seeing that um, monies, uh, those monies uh, being invested in a fast, quick, effective manner. That's what I have for this afternoon. I thank you. I'll take any questions uh, from the colleagues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ernesto. Uh, great presentation. And um, we do, in fact, have time for questions. So um, this is where, in the um, online briefing, I turn it to my colleague, uh, Ellen Vaughn. Um, while Ellen is asking, she's kicking off our Q&A. Uh, just let everyone remind, uh, just a reminder, if you do have any questions, follow us on Twitter at ESI Online. You can also send us an email at ESI at ESI Online. Um, but Ellen, I'll turn it over to you and um, looking forward to a great discussion. Thanks, Dan. And thank you so much, Ernesto and Margarita, for your presentations. Fascinating uh, information packed. I have a lot of questions. And um, so um, I'll just uh, start with one for Margarita. Um, I'm wondering um, about sort of how you are you mentioned the the legislation um certainly the supplemental appropriations um and i'm wondering um if you are engaged with um sort of community organizations in um in the islands um you know how congress might be working with with the communities and then in turn how those communities might be um encouraged or able to uh engage with, with your committee and with Congress? Um, definitely. As Ernesto mentioned during his presentation, um, these natural disasters have uh, resulted um, uh, as an opportunity to invest in the uh, resiliency of infrastructure and transformation of some of the um, institutions in the island. Um, so we have worked with many nonprofit and community or organizations to ensure that they have a say on how these funds are going to be utilized. Uh, we think that is very important. Um, and we have conducted several oversight hearings in which we provide them also an opportunity to participate as panelists um, to share their concerns, their priorities, um, so we can so we can also embrace them and follow up on them when we do oversight of um, federal agencies um, and when we have conversations with local government officials. So for the, the Natural Resources com uh, Committee, engaging with local uh, stakeholders, nonprofits, community organizations, and leaders is definitely a priority. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And um, just to follow up quickly, if I may, um, on that point, uh, on oversight, uh, we were really glad to see the passage of the Disaster Recovery Reform Act and now, uh, which amends the Stafford Act and now, um, of course, FEMA being uh, in charge of implementing a lot of that. Uh, Ernesto talked about um, the value of nature-based solutions. Um, and I'm wondering, uh, I guess we're still seeing, you know, how FEMA will come out with its guidance on that and what projects will be eligible for funding. Um, and uh, I'm wondering if, uh, if the committee will be doing any oversight on, on that in particular. describing. Uh, we're actually currently working on uh, legislation. Our committee, I work for the Office of Insular Affairs, which primarily deals with the issues that affect the, the territories. Uh, but we also have a water and ocean subcommittee 
that focuses on, on um, the programs that, for example, Ernesto uh, works with. Um, and they are drafting um, currently language to also take into consideration the specific needs of um, Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands and also the territories in the Pacific. Um, so um, in terms of um, oversight of FEMA specifically, uh, we're not necessarily uh, pursuing it um, that way. Um, what we are doing is actually working on legislation to provide other mechanisms for the territories to have the resources uh, to invest in those initiatives. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And Dan, I don't know if I have another question. I could go on, but I want to uh, look well, to see a, if we um, I have a couple questions here from our audience. Yeah, so maybe I'm having a hard time hearing. I'm not sure if if that's something that's just a me problem or if it's an everybody problem. Hopefully it's just a me problem. Um, but let's go to the audience. I, I We do have a couple that have come in, and I'm going to, since we're a little short on time, I'm going to try to consolidate some of these so that um, Margarita, you and Ernesto can both have an opportunity to answer. Um, question is uh, about barriers to spending the resources that have been provided by Congress. And I'm wondering if you could uh, sort of discuss for a moment sort of maybe one or the two of the key barriers that prevent projects from being implemented and then specifically um, how the cost benefit analysis either encourages or discourages the use of nature-based solutions um margarita happy to start with you and then definitely want to make sure that ernesto has an opportunity to to provide his perspective as well um in terms of the the barriers for ut utilizing the funds um, the, the main barrier we, we have experienced has been um, cuts, procedures, and, and the timeline to actually publish the, the notices that are required um, to disperse the, the community development block grants. Um, that has taken um, approximately two, two and a half years um, for us to, to see progress, and that's only the first step um, for, for the process to move forward. Um, we have also seen delays in, in the approval of grant, um, grant um, applications. Um, so, so we think it's essential to expedite um, that process um, while ensuring that there are controls in place um, so that the people of Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands also have the, the resources that, um, that they need to rebuild and be ready for for the possibility of other natural disasters. Thanks, and Ernesto. From your perspective, what are how does the cost benefit analysis that's done for these projects? How, what kind of impact does that have on the types of projects that are selected, and sort of what the barriers of implementation are? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I agree with Margarita that um, you know the guidance and the compliance with the bureaucratic processes is what has stalled the process of effectively investing the funding where it's needed, which is at the community level where the damages occurred. So the need is there, the funding, are, the funding is available, but the connecting vessels to try to effectively convert funding into solutions for the people and build resilience is not happening or is happening a very, at a very slow pace. So that's a, one of the concerns that we do have because we have to deal with the day-to-day -day of those communities that are facing the issues. Uh, so, you know, I have of those many stories. In terms of the nature-based interventions, uh, colleagues from FEMA, uh, as well as from the Army Corps of Engineers and different uh, universities and organizations are working to try to uh, see, to effectively communicate that these nature-based features uh, are, you know, they meet building codes, standards, they effectively attenuate, ameliorate, and uh, dissipate energy and can deal with forces and loadings that uh, uh, protect life and property, but uh, 
when the decisions are made using the existing BCA tools, uh, those uh, investments that may be higher in the short term, but would lower operations and maintenance in the mid to longer term, as well as infrastructure that will have longer design life, are not favored. Obviously, there is a, a still a, a, a discussion, a dialogue that must happen. So uh, we move uh, to this next generation of infrastructure, particular, particularly in the coastal realm. Great, thanks. Um, well, this has been uh, really enlightening um, and it's a great way to kick off our briefing mini series for the week. Um, I hope that uh, all of our audience is able to join us for part two tomorrow at three o'clock uh, as well for to, to cover to discuss resilient housing and communities and then on Thursday, I have to think about that for a second. The days kind of all seem the same. Um, on Thursday uh, at three o'clock, we'll, we'll look at uh, sustainable democratic energy and public health. But Margarita and Ernesto, we couldn't have asked for two better panelists to kick us off. So thank you very much. If we were in person, there would be a thunderous applause. Um, but uh, unfortunately, we're only able to do this virtually today. Thank you, Alan. Um, Thank you very much. Um, let me just uh, reiterate one last time that um, the a video recording of this will be available at esi.org, as well as written materials, a written summary of everything that you just heard. Uh, Ernesto's slides will be available as well. Um, let me also just thank uh, Troy, uh, who helps us uh, provide or produce this webcast so that it looks so professional and looks so nice. So he's a great friend to EESI. Thank you, Troy. Let me also thank Ellen for uh, all of the hard work that went into organizing this briefing mini series. Let me also thank Omri, Dan O'Brien, Anna McGinn, Amber Totteroff, Sydney O'Shaughnessy, as well as uh, two interns. This is their first briefing, uh, Maya Crook, uh, as well as Bridget Williams. So thanks to everybody. It takes a lot of work to go into these things and thanks to everyone on Team ESI. Uh, stay tuned for tomorrow. And if you have a moment, if you haven't yet, please fill out our survey. Um, I think there may be a screen with a link. Um, we'd love to hear your feedback. Um, we're always trying to do better to bring uh, information about climate change, environmental and clean energy solutions to you. And if you have any feedback you'd like to share, we always read it. And um, until tomorrow, um, thank you so much. And I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Thank you again. Thank, thank you very much. much.